is Larry Duke, who's been visiting us this year from the University of Toronto. Um, thanks for having me. I want to talk today about the polynomial method and to give a kind of survey talk or sort of uh, philosophical talk, philosophical discussion about it. Um, it's a kind of active area, hot area. Um, uh, I just, while I was having tea before this talk started, I heard about a new application of the polynomial method to sums and products. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about the application that kind of uh, got me interested in it, which I think was the most, most dramatic event, um, which is the solution of the Kakea problem in finite fields. So I'm going to start with that example, and then we'll see more examples, and in between talk about the philosophy of, of what, what this method is. OK, so suppose FQ is the finite field with Q elements, which I'll just write as F. And then um, if I have a set in the vector space FQN, this is called a Kakea set if it contains a line in every direction. And the finite field Kakea problem asks, how big does a Kakea set have to be? To make sure it's clear, let me say, um, if I look at the projective space, Pfn minus 1, this is defined to be the set of the lines through the origin in, um, in Fn. Um, and by a line in every direction, I mean that for every L in the projective space, every element, there should exist some vector v in the vector space so that the translate L plus v is contained in the set k. That's what it means to be a Kakea set. OK. And the theorem about the size of Kakea sets was proved by Zev de Vier, I think, in 07. Um, and it says the following thing. So if k is a Kakea set, then the size of k is at least some constant that depends on the dimension n times q to the n, which I'll write like this. So in other words, the Kakea set needs to occupy some definite fraction of the entire vector space. OK. And the proof of this is very short, and it consists of two ideas. The first idea is that we should approximate this set k with a polynomial. Or more precisely, we should find a polynomial whose zero set contains the set k. And I'll make that a proposition. So the proposition says if we just have any set in Fn, um, then there exists a non-zero polynomial of degree d um, so that p restricted to x is uniformly 0. It vanishes on the set x. And the degree d is not too big compared to x. So the degree d is controlled by the size of x to the power 1 over n. And the proof of this is just an application of linear algebra. It goes like this. Um, let's say that capital V, capital V sub D, is the vector space of polynomials and n variables, and n variables over F with degree at most D. And you can write down an explicit list. Uh, you know, the, the, the monomials of degree at most d are a basis for this vector space. And you can explicitly figure out how many of them there are. So the dimension of this space, v sub d, is d plus n choose n, which is roughly d to the n. OK. And now I have a bunch of points, a set x. And I'd like my polynomial to vanish at each point. And so for every x. I might consider the condition that p of x equals 0. And the point is that this is a linear condition. This is a linear <laughs> condition on the polynomial p. It's a nonlinear condition on x, but it's a linear condition on the polynomial p. So as long as the size of x is less than this dimension, then um, I can 
choose a non-zero polynomial that vanishes at all those points because the number of linear conditions that I have to satisfy is less than the dimension of my vector space. Okay, so that's the first step. We put the set that we care about in the zero set of a polynomial. The next uh, step is to consider how many directions of lines there may be in the zero set of a polynomial of a given degree. And that's answered by proposition two. It says that um, if z is z of p, the zero set of a polynomial of degree d, then um, z contains lines in at most d times q to the n minus 2 directions. OK. Um, so the proof of this is some fairly simple algebraic geometry. First of all, there are only around q to the n minus 1 directions. So I may as well assume that d is less than q. OK. Now, um, this z is sitting inside of fn. And fn is sitting inside of the projective space um, of dimension n. And that projective space is fn together with the points at infinity, which make up pfn minus 1. And each one of these points corresponds to a direction. OK. Now, z is the zero set of a polynomial, so that's an affine variety in fn. But it extends to a projective variety in pfn. So z bar is the corresponding projective variety in pfn. OK. Um, now the next point is the following lemma. Um, suppose that um, L is in pf n minus 1, meaning it's a line through the origin in fn. And so then I'm going to denote by brackets of L is the point in um, the point at infinity in um, pfn. So somebody in there. And if I just write L, that means the line, which is a subset of fn. OK. So the, the lemma is that if I have this degree less than q, like I've been assuming, and if L plus some vector v is uh, contained in z, then the corresponding point at infinity is also contained in z. And the proof is that um, if I take this L plus v, this set, and I union that point at infinity, this is a projective line. It's a projective line sitting in PFM. And now um, if I look at z bar intersect this line, L bar, um, it's at least q, because I've assumed that those q points are all in the variety z. So this intersection has at least q points, but the degree of the projective variety z bar is, uh, is d, which is strictly less than q. And so the only way that this can happen is for the whole projective line to lie in z bar. So L bar lies in z bar, and in particular, this point at infinity lies in z bar. OK. So um, for every, every line, for every direction where we have a line in our set z, we get a point at infinity lying in here in the variety z bar. So the last thing we need to do is to estimate the size of z bar intersect fpn minus 1. We want to know how big that is. And um, this thing is just a projective variety of degree d um, in fpn minus 1. And the polynomial that cuts out this variety is just the highest order part of our original polynomial p. And so, th so the size of that is bounded by the degree times q to the n minus 2, 
which is just a standard bound for the number of points in a projective variety of degree d. Okay. Um, so that's it. You put those two propositions together, and that proves that Kakea sets have to occupy a certain definite fraction of the vector space. And it was, um, it was very surprising when it first came out because this was considered to be quite a hard problem. Um, I'll look at what I wanted to say about this. Yeah, well, so there were, there were quite a body of, there were a reasonable number of rather difficult papers trying to estimate the size of these sets and not getting too close to the right answer. And it turns out that if you think about the polynomials this way, there's a remarkably short proof. And it's the, on, it's the only proof that we have at the present time. So it seems that if you don't mention polynomials, it remains extremely hard to understand the size of a Kakea set in a finite field. Um, OK, so this is what I think of as the, the um, archetypal example of the polynomial method. And the key thing about it that, uh, say, quote unquote, defines the polynomial method is the use of this proposition. There is, there is some kind of previous history of the polynomial method. So the, the first person who I would think of as, as doing something in this spirit was 2A in 1909, who was working on Diophantine approximation. Um, and another important one was Stepanov around 1970, who was working on the number of points in a curve over a finite field. Um, and they both use the polynomial method in the sense that at some point in their proof, they have to construct a use, they have to find a useful polynomial. And rather than constructing it, they use proposition one or something in that spirit. Um, so I was looking in the library at, um, at some history a little bit. And in 1974, Wolfgang Schmidt gave a talk about the work of Tue and Stepanov and some related things at the ICM. And he made some historical comment about what 2A did, which, which goes as follows. The idea of asserting the existence of certain polynomials, rather than explicitly constructing them, is the essential new idea in 2A's work. As Siegel points out, a study of 2A's papers reveals that 2A at first tried very hard to construct the polynomials explicitly, um, and he even could do that for some of the polynomials that he looked for, and then he sort of gave up, and he found them by, a, by this counting argument or something similar. OK. Um, the philosophy, so, so, the, but, so the philosophy behind it, the, the tool is that we'll use counting arguments to find interesting polynomials and then use them to do something. But still, the philosophy is not that clear. It's not clear to me, you know, is this really hard to prove without polynomials? And if so, why? And what sort of problems are polynomials going to help with? OK. Um, I want to go, go on now and discuss the next example where the polynomial method has been useful, which is the studying the incidences of lines in three-dimensional space. Um, OK. So now let's suppose that L is a set of n squared lines in three-dimensional space. And I'd like to, I'm interested in the points where they intersect. So let's call the set of intersections Q is the set of uh, x that lie in at least two lines. Um, OK, so uh, a very basic question is, how big can the set of Q be in terms of n? Um, and that's an easy question. Any two lines intersect in at most one point, and they can all intersect in different points. So this can be as big as n squared choose 2. And the obvious way for them to do that is for all of the lines to stick together into a plane. Um, OK. Um, so, But then you might wonder if all of the situations where there are quite a lot of intersections have some special or nice structure like being stuck together in a plane. And something like that is true. 
and can be proven using the polynomial method. And the, the first result in that direction is the following um, polynomial structure theorem. So proposition of myself and Nets cats. Um, so let's suppose that the size of this set Q is n to the 3 plus sigma. Um, and I'm going to make a minor technical assumption, which is that all of the lines have around the same number of incidences. So let's just assume that every line contains at least around the size of Q over n squared points of Q. It just makes things easier in a technical way, because if some lines have a lot of intersections and others have fewer, then the statement will involve these two sets of lines and be a little bit more complicated. OK. Then the conclusion is that the whole set of lines L is contained in the zero set of a polynomial of degree like n to the 1 minus sigma. Now, to put this into context, there's uh, a theorem that I should mention, which is the analog of this proposition 1 for lines instead of points. I'll, I'll put it here. Let's call this proposition 1 prime. So proposition 1 says that just any set of points in a vector space lies in a polynomial of a certain degree that depends on how many points. And similarly, just any set of lines lies in a polynomial of a certain degree, um, namely um, L lies in the zero set of some p, where the degree of p is at most around n. And it's proven the same way by counting parameters. <coughs> OK, so any old set of lines lies in the zero set of a polynomial of degree around n. When you say such a thing is the contained? Yeah, what this means is that the union of this set of lines is completely contained in the zero set of that polynomial. I've adopted, I, I so n squared is the number of lines, uh, and n is the degree. Okay. And that, I was wondering whether that was a good choice when I was writing my talk this morning. It just comes out of, it's just the language we used in the paper with Nance. Yeah. Okay. So um, this theorem is true for all sigma, but it's only interesting if sigma is positive. When sigma is positive, this degree drops below n, and when the degree do drops below n, that means that the set of lines has some algebraic structure. It's easier to embed it in the zero set of a polynomial than a generic set of lines. It has some polynomial structure. So lots of intersections implies polynomial structure. So just, just to understand you, you said assuming 1 is the set of points of a constant, or? Um, that's right. So if sigma is 1, if the number of intersections is like, say, 1 tenth n to the fourth, then all of these lines will lie in a surface of constant degree, degree 100. OK. Um, so the, the proof of that is similar to the proofs that we've just seen. But there's a little trick which allows us to use, um, to use this large number of intersections to kind of amplify how well our polynomial approximates our surface. So here's the proof. Um, D is our degree. Let's just choose that later. Now, we can't immediately get a degree D polynomial that vanishes on all of our lines. That's what we're working for. But we can immediately apply proposition 1 prime and get our degree D polynomial to vanish on D squared lines. So can get P degree D that vanishes on any d squared lines. OK, so I'm going to take d squared of the lines from my set and have a polynomial that vanishes on them. And I'm going to pick them randomly. So pick d squared random lines contained in my set L and call them good lines. And my polynomial ra uh, vanishes on all of the good lines. And then I claim that it, in fact, vanishes on all of the lines if I choose, if I choose D right. So let's consider any old line in our set, which is drawn here. And by assumption, it has at least this many points of intersection. So 
there are at least this many lines, other lines that are going through it. So I have a picture like that. OK, and the number of these other lines that go through it is size of, size of q n to the minus 2 lines. OK, now there aren't all good lines, but we can take a guess about what fraction of them are going to be good lines. Because there are d squared good lines, and there are n squared total lines. So uh, on average, the line L intersects at least um, size of q n to the minus 2 times d squared over n squared good lines. This is the number of lines of L that it intersects, and this is the fraction of lines of L that are good. OK. Um, now we're picking the good lines at random. And as we do that, the number of intersections with a fixed line L may go up or down a little bit. But there's a law of large numbers involved here. So in fact, um, every L in L intersects in this ballpark, so at least one-tenth times, I'll just copy down this number, good lines. But I'll draw them in orange. So there's a certain nice fraction of those. And my polynomial vanishes on all of those orange good lines. Um, so now um, P vanishes on the line L as long as the degree of L is less than that number of intersections. Once that number of intersections is more than d, then my polynomial vanishes at more than d points along the line. And the only way it can do that is to vanish on the entire line. OK, so let's just unwind what this means. We have d less than 1 tenth um, q n to the minus 4 d squared. So I'm going to put the d over on the right and everything else on the left. And what will come out of this is that d, so I put the d over on the right and everything else over on the left. So d bigger than n to the fourth q inverse. And q was n to the 3 plus sigma. So this is 10 n to the 1 minus sigma. So as long as d is a bit bigger than that, 11 n to the 1 minus sigma, this argument shows that the entire set of lines will lie in the zero set of the polynomial p. OK. So this is the trick where we leveraged having a lot of intersections to get a little bit more out of our polynomial method. This proposition starts to kick in as soon as the intersection number of intersections is significantly above n cubed. And starting with this argument, we've developed actually an extremely good understanding of the intersection patterns that can result in more than n cubed intersections. Some log? Um, there's no logarithm in this argument, I don't think. Oh, to get this? Yes, I got um, Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so if the, yeah. Um, I'm going to mention doubly ruled surfaces in a second, but I don't think they contradict this. Yeah, maybe I should mention it now. Um, I'm going to come back to that question about the log. I think it was a good question, but let me mention the doubly ruled surfaces because Zev thinks it's related, and then we'll see. Uh, We'll iron out all of the little problems here. OK. Um, so here's a great example of how some lines could be arranged to produce a lot of intersections. It's called a doubly ruled surface. Um, OK. So one example of a doubly ruled surface is the surface defined by the polynomial z equals x times y. And now if I look in the xy plane, if I draw um, so if I draw a horizontal line in the xy plane, and then I lift this line up to the graph z equals x times y, I'll get a line in three-dimensional space. 
So there's a whole family of lines in this surface that come from the horizontal lines. And the rules of x and y are interchangeable, so exactly the same is true for vertical lines. Um, so this surface has two families of lines contained in it. Um, a ruled surface is a surface with a family of lines contained in it, and a doubly ruled means what you think. And in particular, by choosing lines in this doubly ruled surface, I can get a lot of intersections. I can choose half of my n squared lines to be these quote unquote horizontal lines, and half of them to be the vertical lines, and then I'll get close to n to the fourth intersections. If I take that n to the fourth and I plug it in here, I have that sigma is 1. And that means that the whole set of lines should lie in a polynomial of degree of order 1, which they do. They lie in that polynomial. OK. Now, I think the question about logs was, when I went from this on average to every, what was I using? Um, so, you know, if this, if this number is typically very large, like n to the alpha for a positive alpha, then if you think about the way it's distributed, its fraction of being one-tenth of its average, its chance of being one-tenth of its average value is extremely low. It'll be like e to the minus n to the something. And that will never happen because there are only n squared lines. But there is a technical case, which is that, you know, if this thing is on the order of one, then you have to redo that analysis. So I'll just put here, um, there, there might be log terms if um, the degree is small. If, uh, yeah, if d is small, which corresponds to sigma, say sigma equals 1. OK. Um, OK, so I was saying that, I was trying to say that we have a very good understanding of how lines may be arranged to cause more than n cubed <coughs> intersections. This is one example that causes more than n cubed intersections. And this is basically the only example, which can make precise in the following theorem. Okay, suppose L is n squared lines in R3, arranged however, then there exists some doubly ruled surfaces D1 and so on. And some of the lines are in these doubly ruled surfaces, so Li is the set of lines L which are in the surface Di. And then the theorem says that the, um, the q associated to L, the size of this, is less than or equal to the sum of the q's of the doubly ruled surfaces plus a constant times n cubed. So I can take a, a bunch of doubly ruled surfaces. I can put lines in them. The lines in each doubly ruled surface, there will be a bunch of intersections just of lines within that surface. And there could be a lot of those. And the contribution of all of the other intersections is controlled by n cubed. So the only way to get over n cubed is to use doubly ruled surfaces. So I didn't say anything about how many surfaces I have. There is also, uh, so there'll be less than or equal to n surfaces. Um, and in, in this setup, there would be it, so the main way that this happens is to have n to the 1 minus sigma doubly ruled surfaces and have the lines distributed among them. All these are there some infinite number of different doubly ruled surfaces? Okay, right. So, um, so I gave you an example of a doubly ruled surface, but I should say something about the set of all doubly ruled surfaces. Um, there, there are infinitely many of them. Um, you can put 17 in front of x, y. That's right. Yeah, so there's a, a finite parameter family of doubly ruled surfaces. All of them are degree 2 algebraic surfaces. That is definitely worth saying. Or, or planes. So I'm going to count a plane as a degenerate case of a doubly ruled surface. It's an infinitely ruled surface. Um, and um, 
you can explicitly write them all down there. So there's more than just writing a parameter there, but there's only five or six per, I don't know, some small number of parameters. It's nothing terrible. OK. Um, so the, I guess that the philosophy behind this result is the following. Lines are algebraic curves. And they kind of like to nestle together into algebraic surfaces. And um, it's hard for them to nestle together, not into algebraic surfaces. So that's part of the philosophy. Um, but I also philosophically wonder about this n cubed. Why is n cubed the dividing line, where all of a sudden we have this structure? Or is, is it even true that n cubed is the dividing line? where we have this structure. There's a philosophically clear dividing line that happens at n squared. The reason is that um, if you to, 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 look for, to look for significantly more than n squared incidences is an overdetermined problem. Each, we have, um, you know, the, the space of lines has a four parameter space. And we have n squared lines, so we have four n squared parameters. And every incidence is like an equation. So as soon as you look for more than four n squared incidences, you have more equations than parameters. And this happens only sort of by coincidence. And one can make that formal by, for example, talking about generic families of curves. So here's a proposition. Um, suppose that uh, s with this funny line through it is a generic four parameter family of smooth curves in R3. Sorry about that. So for comparison, the set of lines is a form parameter family of smooth curves in R3, but not generic. OK. And suppose that S without a line through it um, is n squared of these curves. Um, no matter how I pick them, if this original family is generic, no matter how I pick these n squared curves, the size of q, the number of points of intersection, will be bounded by around n squared. So the fact that you can arrange to have more than n squared incidences is just because lines are special. And that raises the question, mm, what's special about lines? One thing that's special about lines, which is fairly clear, is that lines can arrange themselves in planes. So you can easily put all of your lines in a plane, and that's a, that's a game changer. And a second thing, which is a little bit more sophisticated about lines, is that they're algebraic curves. And so there are different algebraic structures that they can be involved in. And this, for this problem, the only example that I know about is this W-ruled surface. So those are some things that are special about lines. And those are all of the things that I know that are special about lines. Um, and so, well, here's a question to probe that. Um, maybe kind of naive. Um, suppose that L is a set of n squared lines in R3. And I have at most, say, 1,000 lines in any algebraic surface of degree less than, I mean, these exact numbers hopefully don't matter that much. I'll put 10. Um, so how big can Q be? Can Q be, does it follow that Q is bounded by n to the 2 plus epsilon? Um, that would be really strong and interesting if it's true. And if it's not true, then it means that there's a, a way of arranging lines, which is, uh, yeah? Would it just be adjusted in the sample to double the surface? Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, or even we'll put just, uh, I'll put respectively just doubly ruled surfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, I think it's true that these other algebraic surfaces, um, once you put a lot of lines in them, they have to become doubly ruled surfaces. So. If we assume that for any algebraic 
for any doubly ruled surface, uh, we have at most 1,000 lines in that surface, then what does that say about the size of the set of intersections? Yeah. OK. OK, so that's pretty much what I know about the size of the intersection set of lines and, and what I don't know about it. Um, the last piece of the polynomial method that I want to describe to you is the um, equal partitioning problem. So we're going to change gears a little bit. Um, so now suppose that I have a set in the plane of points. So this is uh, uh, S points. And I would like to cut up the plane, to, to divide the plane so that the points are kind of evenly distributed into the pieces. And the division has a nice geometric structure. So for example, um, uh, so for example, I might take D lines in the plane. And if these, are, if these are not too many parallel to each other, it cuts the plane into D squared cells. Um, and so I would like to consider the question, given a set of points, can I choose d lines in such a way that the points are equally distributed among the d squared cells? This is a problem that comes up in some places in, in combinatorics in the plane and also in some sort of applications in computer science that are related to combinatorics in the plane. Um, OK. But the answer to this question in general is no. Um, so let me give you an example of some points that we cannot cut up equally distributed by using a bunch of lines. OK, so here's the example. Suppose that gamma is a convex curve, and the set of my points is contained in gamma. So that looks like so. OK. Now the issue here is that whenever I draw a line in this picture, a line can only intersect a convex curve twice. So if I draw d lines, um, I may produce d squared components, but I'll only cut the convex curve 2d times. So there will only be 2d of the components that have any points in them at all. And so, so it will be nowhere near equally distributing the points. Moreover, um, this condition, so let me call this, let me write it this way. So there exists a convex curve, and my point lies on the curve. Let's call that condition star. Condition star is actually an open condition about a set of points. Namely, if I, if I wiggle these points, there's not a lot of room, but there's a tiny radius where if I wiggle the points in that radius, I can move the curve and keep it convex and keep it on the points. So there's a, it's not, the, the bad sets that I can't cut up this way are an open set in the parameter space of where I could put the points. Um, and um, my, my feeling is that the bad sets are fairly rare. Like if you Gaussianly independently picked a bunch of points, I think you could cut them up with lines and equally distribute them pretty well. Um, but still, I don't know a, a useful way of characterizing. Um, I'm sorry? Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I don't unfortunately know anything about DC dimension, but maybe yeah, maybe someone afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, 
So here's the next game we're going to play. Uh, now we're going to introduce polynomials. So d lines is an example of a degree d algebraic curve. But of course, it's a very special example. So instead, so we're going to generalize and let z be a degree d algebraic curve. And we can try to use our degree d algebraic curve to divide our points into equal, equal pieces. And I should mention um, that a degree d algebraic curve, like a set of d lines, typically leads to d squared cells. It won't lead to more than that. And it could lead to less than that, but there's a good good large class of examples where we'll get around d squared cells. And we'd like to equidistribute the points. Well, something could go wrong which is very similar to this. Namely, that all of the points could lie on an ellipse or on some low degree algebraic curve. Um, so uh, example two. Um, there could be gamma and ellipse and um, x in gamma. OK. And now we have a very similar problem to before. Because if I look at my degree d curve intersect gamma, um, this is at most 2 times d. An algebraic curve can only vanish at two d points of my ellipse. So I once again can only cut my points into, uh, into 2d of the d squared cells. So it looks almost like before. But this example is a lot more rigid than the last example. In particular, so for example, lying on an ellipse is not an open condition about a large number of points. If I wiggle the points a little, it won't be true. Um, so having a bunch of points that lie on an ellipse means that they have algebraic structure in the sense that a little while ago we were talking about lines having algebraic structure. So based on this example, it's at least plausible that either you can cut up the points equally with a nice algebraic variety, or the points have algebraic structure, which prevents you from doing that. And that dichotomy turns out to be basically true. So I'm going to state a theorem that, that basically says that, but I'll make it precise. OK, so theorem, if uh, call it, I'll call it q now, q contained in R2 is a finite set. And then d greater than 0 is a degree. Um, then there exists a z of p, degree d variety. And it cuts the space into cells. So R2, so R2 take away this variety is a disjoint union of open cells. And the number of cells should be around d squared. Um, and here's the conclusion. Um, for each of these cells, if I intersect with the point Q, this is bounded by um, the original number of points times d to the minus 2, and there's a constant. <coughs> OK. And these are open. OK. Now, I should make a remark, because the way it's written, there's something very important that's, that's maybe not high, that I need to highlight, which is that the union of these cells is not the entire plane. It's just the plane outside of the variety. And there's nothing that says that the points have to lie in the cells at all. They're allowed to lie on the variety. So, um, so Nett suggested thinking about this as a dichotomy. One extreme case is that the set Q is contained completely in the variety, which is absolutely allowed by our theorem. And so let's call that the polynomial structure case. And another extreme case is that the the set Q is contained completely in the cells. And I'll call that the polynomial random case. And there's, there's some in between, but the in between isn't a big deal. It just means that the set has, you know, it's a unit of two sets, one of which is kind of random and one of which has kind of structure. So 
no big deal. So this would be the polynomial structure case. This set of points we can't cut into pieces nicely by a low degree variety, but it lies in a low degree variety. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and it also works in all dimensions with no problem. So if we want to go to Rn, I just have to change all the twos to ns. So it looks like this. And that's the better way to state it, because why not? OK. Um, Terry Tao gave a talk at the ICM um, four years ago that was called like, Randomness and Structure in Arithmetic Combinatorics. And the theme of this talk was if, if you have a set and you're trying to prove an arithmetic combinatorics theorem about this set, then a lot of them have this kind of two-case proof. Either the set has some quote-unquote arithmetic structure, which could mean different things, and you use that to prove your conclusion, or the set has some kind of arithmetic combinatorics quasi-randomness, and you use that. They're both useful, and they imply your conclusion for two different reasons. Um, so this theorem fits into a kind of analogous proving strategy for uh, problems in geometric combinatorics, where you take your set you care about, and either it has kind of polynomial structure, and you use that to prove nice things about it, or you can cut it up into pieces evenly, and you can use that to prove nice things about it. I'm going to um, sketch the proof of this theorem. Uh, OK. So, we might as well assume that the number of regions we want to divide into is a power of 2. It's not a big deal, and powers of 2 are reasonably dense. And, um, and then we can do it by induction. So let's assume that we already have a nice way of cutting it up into 2 to the j minus 1 pieces. And now what we want to do, so we have some, some picture like this. So I've already cut my points into, into four even pieces. And now I'd like to bisect each of those four pieces. OK. Um, now there's a theorem that allows me to do the bisection. And that's called the polynomial ham sandwich theorem, which is a theorem from classical, fairly classical algebraic topology. It was proven by Stone and Tukey in 1942. And it says the following thing. Um, if I have u1 up to us finite volume sets in Rn, and s is around d to the n, then there exists a degree d polynomial that bisects all the sets. So if I have these four sets in the plane, this is too many sets to bisect with a line, but it's possible to bisect all of them with a degree two algebraic curve. And that looks sort of like, like so. And that's not a great drawing. Um, and so let's say the polynomial may be positive where I put the plus signs and negative where I put the minus signs. And the word bisect means that the area of the positive part and the area of the negative part are supposed to be the same, not really like in the picture. I'm sorry? There could be, in, in this theorem, there could be a lot of points. These are finite volume open sets. Now, there's an issue that you're pointing out, 
these are finite sets of points, and these are finite volume open sets. So there's something to say about how to connect from here to here. And the, way that, the way to do that is to take an epsilon ball around each of the points. That's now a finite volume open set. And this set here is u1, uh, u3, or u2, and so on. Um, now these sets are each disconnected, which makes it look different from this picture. But the theorem doesn't require the sets ui to be connected. This union of those two disks is a perfectly valid finite volume open set. And then, the, um, then when I apply the polynomial ham sandwich theorem to these epsilon balls, it tells me that I can find a polynomial that bisects each set. So it might look something like this. But there are two ways to go about bisecting these sets. One way is to have half of the balls on each side. But another way is to bisect each of the balls, like that. So those, are both, those could both happen. OK. And then we take the limit as epsilon goes to 0. And we'll get a sequence of varieties. And some subsequence will converge. It's not a big issue. And it will either bisect, like having equal numbers of points on both sides, or there could be a lot of points on the variety. Well, that's the inductive step. You just do that repeatedly, and you count what the degree is, and you get that theorem. OK. Um, so I want to end by giving an idea of how this theorem can be applied to proof stuff in geometric combinatorics. Um, so it comes from a, it comes from, oh, this is bad form. Uh, so this theorem is due to Nets, Katz, and myself. And it comes from a paper where we proved estimates for the Erdős distance problem. Um, so I'm not going to go, it's, it's uh, a longish story to get all the way from here to the Erdős distance problem. But I want to indicate how to use that to prove some things about um, incidence theory for lines in three-dimensional space that are one step past what we were just talking about. OK, so let's go back to our set of lines, L equals n squared lines in R3. And now let me look at, instead of just intersections, q sub k are points that lie in at least k lines. And we'd like to estimate the size of that set. Um, so the, th the theorem about this is the following. It says that either um, the size of qk is bounded by n cubed times k to the minus 2. So if k is 2, we get back basically what we had for just, just intersections. Um, or there are at least n lines on a doubly ruled surface. <coughs> Um, OK. And in light of what, I was, what, what we were thinking about with this theorem, I'd like to give these cases names. The top one is the polynomial random case, and the bottom one is the polynomial structure case. So uh, let's try to outline this. Um, so d is a degree that we choose later. And then we can apply the equal partition theorem to our set qk that we want to study. And we have two cases, plus really some in-between stuff, but it, it's no big deal. One case is the polynomial random case. Case one, qk is contained in the disjoint union of these open cells. And in that case, we can really divide our problem into problems that happen in each cell, which are smaller and therefore simpler. And the reason we can do that, um, so we only need to find, need to find or estimate the size of qk intersect any cell for any i. Because they're, they're all the same, 
and we know how many cells there are. So that's, we just need to figure out that thing. And now we can think about how many lines there are in each cell. So each line only enters less than or equal to d cells. And there are d cubed cells. So each line only hits a fraction, 1 over d squared of them. And that means that a typical cell has only n squared over d squared lines in it. So now we have a reduced problem. We just look at the points in this cell. We just look at the lines that go through. And um, so then we look at the simpler problem in one cell. And at this point, there are two things that we could do. One thing is that we could use, we could apply a simpler method to that one cell. So that's what that's and I did. And another thing is that you could do induction, which was done by Solimosi and Tao in a paper a little while afterwards. But the point is that um, cutting things up nicely into cells like this allows us to, to decompose our problem into a bunch of smaller problems. And if you take some inequality that you know about the situation and you combine it with this cell cutting, you get a better inequality some of the time. And also, since we reduced to a simpler problem, we're in good shape to try to make an inductive argument. And that can be made to work also. OK. Um, that leaves uh, another case. And the, the other case is that we have some polynomial structure. Um, so OK. So in the other case, um, uh, then all of the points lie in a surprisingly low dimensional variety. And in the minute that I have, I can just tell you that you can then prove by a bazoo type argument that all of the lines lie in a surprisingly low dimensional variety. And then um, algebraic geometry becomes a useful tool. Simple algebraic geometry, like the kind we were doing at the beginning for finite field Kakea, becomes a powerful tool to study what this variety might be and how these lines may be arranged. OK, let's stop there. Thank you for your attention.